Welcome. This video is about the D that everyone is talking about. Yes, that vitamin D and how it may or may not help with COVID. But before you watch this video, it would be a good idea to watch my previous video on vitamin D if you haven't already, because that'll help you better understand vitamin D's role in this video. Also, let's review how SARS coronavirus 2 causes some people to have severe disease and sometimes death. It all starts when the virus gets into the lungs all the way down to those tiny little air sacs there called the alveoli. It's those same alveoli that are responsible for bringing oxygen into the blood and removing carbon dioxide from the blood. There are two types of alveoli, type 1 and type 2. The virus attaches to the ACE2 receptor on those type 2 alveoli, and it uses that receptor to gain entry into the cell. Once inside the cell, it hijacks the cell's machinery and starts making copies of itself. But it also causes the cell to have less ACE2 receptor on its surface, and this has consequences, but more on that in a bit. After the virus makes copies of itself inside the cell, it bursts out and starts invading more alveolar cells. Unlike other viruses, the SARS coronavirus 2 then goes to the alveoli's next door neighbor, the pulmonary capillaries. The lining of those pulmonary capillaries is called the endothelium, and they also have ACE2 receptors. The virus then latches onto the ACE2 receptors and invades those cells as well. This also causes a decrease in ACE2 receptors there. Having less ACE2 receptors is bad, because ultimately, that leads to a buildup of more and more angiotensin 2 in the lungs and less angiotensin 1, 7 and 1, 9. This causes an increase in constriction of the arteries that go to the lungs. This is known as pulmonary vasoconstriction. It also leads to higher likelihood of clot formation and more inflammation in general. So when the virus invades, not only does it cause alveolar and pulmonary capillary destruction, but it also leads to the cytokine storm and massive inflammation. And all this is made worse as a result of decreased numbers of those ACE2 receptors. So what does not having enough vitamin D have to do with this? And if insufficient vitamin D levels cause more severe disease, why is that? Well, I have to first clarify that it's not proven that insufficient levels of vitamin D lead to worse outcomes. But while it hasn't been proven, it also certainly hasn't been disproven. There's more and more compelling evidence suggesting that lower levels leads to worse outcomes. And there's no question that vitamin D plays an important role in our immune system. More and more studies are coming out that are sorting out its exact role in this capacity. But the link between poor vitamin D status and the risk of certain infections remains cloudy. Let's rewind to 2017 for a second, because at that time, there was a meta-analysis study that consisted of 25 different randomized trials with about 11,000 patients in total evaluating the incidence of acute respiratory infections. Vitamin D supplementation reduced the percentage of patients experiencing an acute respiratory tract infection. The incidence of these URIs in the vitamin D group was 40.3%, compared to 42.2% in the placebo group. In a subgroup analysis, vitamin D supplementation was most effective in patients with vitamin D levels less than 10 NGs per ml, and in those treated with daily or weekly smaller doses as opposed to a huge single dose. The takeaway message from this meta-analysis study is that being vitamin D deficient probably makes people more prone to getting upper respiratory infections, and that's why they should take supplemental vitamin D. But people who have low levels should be taking supplemental vitamin D regardless. Vitamin D has major effects on nearly all cells of our immune system, including dendritic cells, macrophages, and T and B lymphocytes. All of these immune cells have a receptor that binds to vitamin D called, wait for it, vitamin D receptor, or VDR for short. And this study showed that there are over 30 single nucleotide polymorphisms of the VDR gene, meaning over 30 different variations of the gene that codes for VDR. Several of these genetic variants are associated with higher likelihood of URIs. So some people, because of their genetics, are more prone to getting URIs. When vitamin D binds to VDR, it then influences the expression of certain genes. It essentially tells the cell to start making more molecules that play a role in fighting off infection. It tells the cell to start making certain cytokines in groups of molecules called cathelicidins and beta-defensins. 
LL37 is the one and only active cathelicidin in our body. It's been shown to disrupt the membrane of the influenza virus and inhibit production of new viral particles for some types of viruses. It also alters cytokine production. Our immune system also has beta defenses, which is another group of molecules that help fight infections. Beta defensin 2 in particular has been shown to have antiviral properties against influenza. Vitamin D in combination with the VDR increased gene expression of beta defensin 2, meaning it increases beta defensin 2 levels inside certain cells of our body, such as immune cells and alveoli. But it also tells the cell to decrease the production of certain molecules that play a role in the cytokine storm. Pulmonary epithelial cells, including alveoli, contain high levels of 1-alpha-hydroxylase enzyme, which is the enzyme that allows for local production of 1-alpha-25-dihydroxyvitamin D, which is the active form of vitamin D, also known as calcitriol. So calcitriol inhibits the production and secretion of many cytokines and chemokines, including RANTES, which is also known as CCL5. If you watched my previous videos, you may recall that RANTES is like a magnet that attracts CD4 lymphocytes to further participate in that cytokine storm, which is causing even more damage. It's also known that vitamin D deficiency impairs the ability of macrophages to mature and impairs hydrogen peroxide production, which is important for killing off viruses and bacteria. Vitamin D also plays a role in maintaining tight junctions in between the lung cells, which is important to act as a barrier against infection. In a 2016 study, they gave something called LPS to mice. LPS stands for lipopolysaccharide, and essentially it induces sepsis and ARDS. Some of the mice were normal mice, while other mice were VDR knockout mice, meaning they had their VDR gene removed, so they didn't have any VDR. The mice who had the VDR fared better compared to the mice who didn't have it. They found that the mice who didn't have the VDR had more degeneration of alveolar epithelial tight junctions. But also, check this out. In 2017, there's a study where they once again gave LPS to rats. They then gave these rats the active form of vitamin D, calcitriol. What the study showed is that these rats made less angiotensin II and less angiotensin II type 1 receptor, and more of the ACE2 receptor. The rats who received calcitriol also had less lung damage compared to the rats who didn't get calcitriol. So at least in rats, and possibly in humans, vitamin D causes a decrease in angiotensin II in the lungs, which like I mentioned earlier in this video, is a good thing. There was another study that was done in mice that provided evidence that the vitamin D binding to the VDR minimizes lung damage in ARDS by blocking the renin angiotensin system in the lungs. And then there was this interesting study published in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine, which coincidentally was published in December of 2019, the same time that the COVID outbreak started in Wuhan, China. In this study, they looked at people who were critically ill in the ER and measured their vitamin D levels. If they were deficient, they gave them big doses of vitamin D to half the patients. The other half got a placebo. They then moved all of these patients to the intensive care unit. They, of course, treated them for whatever illness they had, in addition to giving them the single dose of 540,000 IUs of vitamin D. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled phase 3 trial. The primary endpoint was 90-day all-cause mortality. There were over 1,000 patients in the study, and all of them had vitamin D levels less than 20 NG per ml. For the ones who received that big dose of vitamin D, their levels on average came up to 50 NGs per ml. The placebo group's levels remained low with an average of 11. The 90-day mortality was 23.5% in the vitamin D group and 20.6% in the placebo group. So the vitamin D3 didn't provide an advantage over placebo with respect to 90-day mortality in critically ill vitamin D deficient patients. And while this study was a well-performed study, there are two big issues with this trial. For one, these patients had low vitamin D levels at baseline, and they didn't get vitamin D until they were already critically ill. It might have been too late for vitamin D to have any significant impact at that point. The second issue with this trial is that they gave vitamin D to critically ill patients in general, not critically ill patients with a specific disease. 
So this study tells us that giving vitamin D to a deficient patient who is critically ill is generally not beneficial, keyword there being generally. But if they repeated this study in, say, just influenza patients or just COVID patients, that would be a very interesting study. Also, the other question becomes, would these patients have had less severe illness had they not been vitamin D deficient? And we don't know. What we do know is that there are certain demographics that have low vitamin D levels. For example, they're usually lower in the elderly, those with darker skin. It also depends on where you live. About 40% of Europeans are vitamin D deficient and 13% are severely deficient. Vitamin D deficiency is more common in the subtropical and mid-latitude countries compared to tropical and high-latitude countries. And severe vitamin D deficiency was found to be nearly 0% in some high-latitude countries. There are probably less people with vitamin D deficiency in those areas because of fortification of food there, and I'm guessing more consumption of fish, which is one of the few foods that has vitamin D. So looking at the demographics, there seems to be a lot of geographic overlap between severe COVID and areas with vitamin D deficiency. In this study in New Orleans, I believe, they looked at vitamin D levels in 20 COVID-19 patients. Two-thirds of the patients required ICU admission. Of the ICU patients, 85% of them had vitamin D insufficiency. Of the 212 cases of COVID-19 in this study, the majority of patients did just fine. The average vitamin D level was 24 NGs per ml, but critically ill patients had the lowest levels. And statistical analysis showed that the higher the vitamin D level, the better the odds of having a better outcome. So randomized controlled trials are desperately needed. And as of right now, there are three that are taking place or are about to take place. There's the COVID trial in France, and then there's another RCT in Iran, and another one in the United States. In this randomized controlled trial in the United States, it's looking at vitamin D in conjunction with aspirin to see if it A, reduces the incidence of COVID, and B, if it lessens the severity of COVID. So the world awaits these results. And when they finally are published, I'll be sure to let you know. So make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit that bell button because I hear that's good for you. So I'm sure there'll be or already are even more randomized controlled trials of vitamin D with COVID. But there are still some big questions that need to be answered, like one, what level of vitamin D is adequate to protect against or minimize the impact of COVID? Two, what level of vitamin D is considered too high? Three, should more and more people get their vitamin D levels checked, especially during this pandemic when less and less people are physically going to the doctor? And four, should people just supplement themselves? And if so, how much? These are all tough questions to answer, 